And then we're going to look at religion. We'll come back to it later. This is one of my, to me, one of the most interesting sites I want to see when y'all pick up a collection so I can go over there. Uh, 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 this is the Nazareth Synagogue. No, the Capernaum Synagogue. You know, when Jesus uh, leaves home, he moves to Capernaum on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. This particular one was made like the 300s AD. But I've got pictures we'll look at when we get there. You can see that they built on top of this foundation, on top of this foundation, on top of this foundation. And you can trace it right back to the time of Jesus. So you can go and stand in a synagogue we know that Jesus preached in. Now, we're going to look at Jewish religion in Jesus' day. I'm sure there were many uh, people who had moved into the area that were not Jewish, that had other religions, but the only religion that mattered in Judea and Galilee and Samaria was Judaism. So what was it like? Of course, the main characteristic of Judaism is its monotheism. Uh, a, an observant Jew, ever since the time of Moses, every day gets up and says, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. But it says it in Hebrew. And they're supposed to say when they rise up and when they lie down and when they walk by the side of the way. There's nothing more central to Judaism than one God. Now, they had a national identity. You'll notice some of this comes out of the textbook that I ask you to look at. But their sense was that they were God's chosen people in God's chosen place, that God has a special destiny for Israel, and the great deliverer is coming, the Messiah. Now, you know, I can't remember my American history, but wasn't there a period where they talk about the manifest destiny, that America was destined to make yeah. the whole world free? Well, uh, people who thought they were free don't much appreciate our attitude about that. Uh, they understand why. Yeah. They think we might be colonial, sort of like Europe was. And, but we're not. We didn't take over Hawaii, or we didn't leave Puerto Rico at a, a sub-state standard, or anything like that. You always be the But, you know, a people have a sense of identity. We do think of ourselves as uh, home of the free and the land of the brave. And there is truth to that. Everybody that's needs a sense think, of identity. That's not all we think of, too, as a nation. Oh, but, but we're better than everybody else. We don't even have any problems. Particularly in the 1950s, there was nothing wrong in America. Oh, we're not in the 1950s. Oh, we're not. And, and, and uh, do you think that uh, everybody was doing well in the 1950s? Yeah. In America? Absolutely. Well. Absolutely. Very well. Oh. And where did you live? <laughs> Excuse me? And where were you living? In New York. Mm -hmm. And if you'd lived in Montgomery, it might have been different. Not by choice. Not by your choice, no. That's right, no. It's by the choice, choice of people who held there. rights down and opportunity down. That's I, true. I will tell you that, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry to get off track again, but a man that I worked with here for a while, he was the registrar, but he was a retired administrator from the Montgomery Public Schools. In fact, he had been my junior high school assistant principal. But he was the principal at Lanier High School, the oldest, nicest at the time, high school, for 31 years. He was there when schools were racially integrated. And he escorted the first black student into the, into the school. At that time, Lanier was in the rich part of town. And the new uh, other white school was Lee High School, which is the one I went to. But it was more blue collar people. Back then there were just the two white schools. There were black schools, but we didn't know much about that. We white people didn't. And he said, we had more trouble at Lee, it's actually a half generation before me when this happened. We had more trouble at Lee with racial integration than they did at Lanier which may seem counterintuitive because we were the working class people and they were the rich people. Mr. Cutt says, 
it's because the working class people felt threatened. If black people have opportunities to take the job, they're going to lose their job. Rich people weren't so threatened. It's that dynamic that I'm talking about when I make fun of Wharton the 1950s great. And uh, no, they weren't all great. And and. But what I was saying that. But depending on where you were, yes. New York didn't have that problem. Right, right. Oh, my wife grew up outside of Boston. In the next town over, there was one black person, you know. It was different. It was different. Well, you have that here in Clanton. Yes. I segregated, integrated, I should say, right. um, United Methodist Church in Clanton. The first black person to be a member. But. And moved it into a but they have welcomed you with open arms, right? Some of them have welcomed you with open arms. Yes. <laughs> the leadership, yes. maybe. <laughs> but just, yes, because that's what I am now, I'm mm -hmm. one of the lay leaders. Right. Also, where I moved, I was the first black person there. Yeah. Let, so, me, let me throw in another perspective, <laughs> and you may find me, because this is my, I grew up in civil rights in Montgomery, so it's, it's my frame of reference. Do any of you know who Fred Gray is from the civil rights movement? He was the first lawyer for Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King in Montgomery. He was also the preacher of what is now the Southside Church of Christ. I grew up in the Church of Christ in Montgomery. I didn't hear of him until I was in my forties and moved away. I mean, it was the I mean it was the same religious group, you know. And I knew nothing about this until somebody told me when I was in my forties. He is a board member emeritus of this university and has been a board member for many years. But we were so segregated that even within my religious tradition, we didn't have anything to do black and white with each other. And what I'm talking about is culture and tradition are so awfully powerful that we don't need to let the world move in and define our values. And that's where Jesus is going to come in as a counter culture, but a very quiet one. So anyway, you and I, we're going to go down memory lane and these, and these young people are going to get tired of us. The Jews also had a central identity. We wander. They had shared religious practices. All Jews attended synagogue, even in Jerusalem. Now, as an educated person, you of course know the difference in a synagogue and a temple in the first century. Definitely. How many temples did the Jews have? One. One. How many synagogues did they have? Nobody can count. How many synagogues did they have before the Babylonian captivity? None. No. There are no synagogues until the Jews no longer have a temple and have been displaced. So the synagogue developed in the 70 years that the Jewish population has been taken over to uh, Babylon, Persia, as it, as it changes over. And there were traditions that grew up, but it was, they no longer had the temple to unite them. And so they developed the reading of the Torah, the, the scriptures. That was the central focus of their gathering. Uh, Sunagoge is the Greek word for come together a gathering. And so on Sabbath, they would come together in synagogues. Everyone went to synagogue. They observed every Sabbath. You did not work on the Sabbath. Uh, one day we'll go into how very Orthodox Jews uh, enforce that today. I'll give you two examples. You do not use an elevator because the tradition was you could not kindle a fire and to run an elevator the electricity has to have a spark and therefore you cannot use an elevator. That's not the only thing. You cannot take anything apart or put anything together. Therefore, before sundown on Friday, you will tear apart your paper towels and your toilet paper so you will not be tearing them on Sabbath. That's going to be real rough. If you think you may need, I was waiting for you to say something. If you think you may need the light on in the middle of the night, because the day starts at sundown, mm -hmm. you better leave it on. So electricity bill. Yeah. No, that's not what it's about. No. That's not what it's about. 
But they also, and, and they did have the temple. And uh, I think I've told you, there's this Temple Mount Society that's already built a new menorah of solid gold taller than a person. They built a crown for the high priest when he returns to the temple. Um, I'll, I'll try to show you that site someday. Um, they've always believed they would go back to the temple. Matter of fact, what, do, what did you say after the Passover meal? Next year in Jerusalem. So would modern day Jews still think there's a Messiah to be coming? Maybe. But I think with the two millennia now of uh, being overshadowed by Christianity, they would say, ah, I'm not sure we knew exactly what we are talking about when we just said Messiah. Okay. By the way, this came up in my other class. Anybody want to guess, uh, in all of its forms, Christianity is the most uh, popular religion in the world. Uh, 31, 32% of the world claims to be Christians. What percent claims to be Jewish? Before I checked this time for class, it was 0.2%. Oh. But a new estimate, uh, from that was from 2010. In 2015, a new estimate is 0.1% of the world population. Wow. Islam is 25% and rising. Yeah, we know that. That's not an actual love, it's more of fear. Never mind, it could be a day. We're just counting religion. Right. And, and, and part of it is because uh, more advanced societies don't have as many children. Many uh, Islamic countries are, are still having lots of children. Mm -hmm. So anyway, and then they had both scripture and tradition. The Torah, what we call the Pentateuch, the law of Moses, uh, inviolable. Everybody agreed you had to do that. And they always agree on what it meant, but then you, you had to do what it said. But then equally, by the time of Jesus, they had developed the traditions of the elders. Sort of like if you go online and you find the, the um, out of copyright commentaries, and you know how many papers we get from Matthew Henry's commentaries and stuff that, you know, from long ago. You just assume that what they wrote was right. Well, the traditions of the elders were as binding as scripture to most Jews. Why don't you wash your hands the way the elders teach us to? Remember how Jesus ran into that? Of course, when you read the recorded discussions of the rabbis on these things, ah, oh, but Rabbi Akiva said this, but Rabbi Hillel said this, and so what is our tradition was very important to who they are. I'm going to go over this quickly. You can study it on your own, these 50-minute classes. Of course, there are the Hebrew scriptures, and I want you to know the Jewish arrangement of what we have in our Old Testament. You see in the middle, under the word Hebrew scriptures, the word Tanakh. It's not spelled with capitals in the middle. I did that for a reason. It's an acronym for the Torah, you see on the left, the Nevaim, you see in the green, and the Ketuvim, which you see in the white. Those are the three parts of the full Hebrew Bible. And they're not in the same order that we use them, except for the Torah. That's less the same. But there's a chronological order. It makes sense the way it goes. Now, the Nevaim means the prophets, but they don't use the word the same way we do. There are the former prophets and the latter prophets. The former prophets being Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. Of course, we say first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, they do too, but um, you think, those people weren't prophets. Well, Samuel was. But prophets spoke for God in that period. So to them, it's more significant that the prophets were active in that period than the various kings or judges. And they don't use the same names we do. Whatever the first few words of the book are, are is, or are, that's the name of that book. Then there are the latter prophets that are like we, like we do them. Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And then what we sometimes call the minor prophets, they call the book of the 12, a collection of 12 other prophets. Why do we group them up in the um, order we do? 
It comes from the Septuagint, the Greek translation from 300 years before Christ. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a more linear uh, Western Greek Roman way of thinking in time. And so we tried to put them in a, in a certain order. I just know that like some of the books aren't, they're not necessarily in chronological order right. in the sense of like But there, there's a sense of order. We think this kind of goes good. Okay. However, on this one, we're not the same, but they're similar. Why did they divide it that way? These, uh, I would best say uh, that means the writings. It would be a stretch to call it fiction by a long shot, but they are more literary than historical. And so you can see Psalms, Proverbs, Job, you can see how those are more like stories or poetry. Songs. Then they have... How would Job be considered like... Well, actually, the term that we use... Oh, yeah. The term that we use is the wisdom literature is a better term for it. But it does have more verse than we can recognize in, in English. Then the five Megillot or scrolls, Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentations, separate from Jeremiah, Ecclesiastes, and Esther. Now that's an odd assortment, yeah. isn't it? Uh, why Esther? How many times is God mentioned in the book of Esther? Not very many. Zero. Oh, that's interesting. That may be a reason. Also, it comes from a time when they were not in Israel. There's nothing uh, about the homeland in it. Ecclesiastes, it's just how horrible life is. Lamentations, <laughs> except for the end. Yeah, I love Ecclesiastes. Lamentations is poetry about the fall of Jerusalem. Ruth is a beautiful story. It does have historical implications, but only at the very end when you find out that David's a descendant. And then Song of Songs. It is the I'm going to assign each of you a chapter of Song of Songs to do a sermon on in chapel. Uh, I would love it. Would you? You're going to do Climb in the Coconut Tree? Mm -hmm. Okay, you explain that one. She's like, uh, I'm going to drop the class. That was last week. Uh, you won't see me. Oh, wait a minute. This is a New Testament class. We can't do that. Sure, we can. Song of Songs and like. Hey, I'll do a sermon on Ecclesiastes. Any thoughts? Oh, Ecclesiastes is great. Yes. Great stuff. All right. We have one minute left. <laughs> <laughs> you notice that these are the post-exilic period. Chronicles seems to be, and Chronicles, you know, is a different presentation, the same information that's in Kings and Samuel. And many people believe that Ezra compiled Chronicles. So maybe that's why they're kept. Now we're going to talk about the different groups. And you've heard, I know, of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Essenes are not mentioned in Scripture. The Zealots are, but it's not real clear who they are. And then uh, the Apocalyptics are not actually a group of people, more uh, a, a style and approach to religion. Sort of like we might say charismatic today. It's not, it's not a denomination, but it's a, a category of, of believers. They'll come up again on these. But the Pharisees uh, were known as early, from the early days of the Hasmoneans. Remember, after the Maccabees, as warriors took over, uh, they came to uh, see themselves as the Hasmonean royal family. The origin of the group seems to have been the need to insist on keeping Judaism Jewish. They had been invaded or conquered or carried away by kingdom after kingdom and empire after empire. Particularly important in the time approaching the New Testament was that the Greek ways had taken over Western culture. And it was as, as offensive to Orthodox Jews as Western culture today is to extremely Orthodox Islamic societies. And so there were significant numbers of Jews who took on the Western ways, the Greek ways. And the Pharisees saw themselves as the strict keepers of the tradition. So they were concerned that you accurately interpret the law, although that became, we've already done that for you. 
but they were concerned with expanding their tradition to meet the current situation. Uh, as a parallel to that, driving in this morning, I heard the uh, candidate for the Supreme Court talking, and he was going on laboriously about what precedent is for the Supreme Court, and when is precedent, it's already settled, and when has a new circumstance arisen where you use the precedent, but you don't necessarily absolutely apply it. So the Pharisees, for all the bad press that the Bible gives them, they had noble goals. But the traditions and doctrines that they developed were crystallized later than the Hebrew Scriptures came together. In other words, it was traditions after Scripture. In particular, the resurrection of the body. The Pharisees came to deduce that the body must be resurrected for eternity. You have one or two verses in the Hebrew Scriptures that kind of allude to life after death, but they're very, very vague. They also came to understand that there will be a last judgment, which again is implied in the Old Testament scriptures, but it's not really fleshed out the way it is in the New Testament. Well, in between, you had the Pharisees who had developed the doctrine that there will be a final judgment day when we'll all answer to God. And in connection with that, that a Messiah would come to usher in the conclusion of, of this world when everyone's brought into judgment before God. Let's we'll stop a moment and, and talk about the word Messiah and the word Christ. They both mean the anointed one. And usually they refer to a kingly type anointing. So one is, is of Hebrew origin and one is of Greek. So Christ and Messiah, the anointed one. But the anointed one would be God's representative coming when everything's being wrapped up together. They also deduced that there would be rewards and punishment in eternity. They deduced it from a few hints at that in the Old Testament. What do you mean by rewards and punishments in eternity? Heaven and hell. Oh. Although they might not have called it that. So those concepts are quite vague in the Old Testament. They are much clearer in the New Testament but they were not new thoughts. Because you remember at one point... They were just expanded. Hmm? They were just, just expanded. Yes. But it becomes tricky when you're saying, well, how much is Jesus speaking to, or Paul quoting from, or Peter, or Jude, from the thinking of their day that people had developed, and how much is he giving this direct revelation of this is what the hereafter is like? Well, I, I say it's by revelation. But... We're going to look at where it intersects with human concepts of what the hereafter and reward and punishment is. So they had developed this. But you know, uh, the, one of the passages that makes it clear, it says uh, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection, but the Pharisees did. Well, that's this distinction. Now, sources say that they were equally focused on promoting and maintaining their own traditions as well as interpreting scripture. I put a question mark there because of the way they come across in the New Testament to me, they were more concerned about their human traditions than they were about scripture. There might be some people today who are the same way. Mm -hmm. Really? Yes. Even in religions. Mm -hmm. Even in people who claim to follow Christ. I've decided it's the task of each of us to separate useful human tradition and religion, not so useful or even um, bad human tradition and religion, and revealed God-given tradition and religion. And believe me, in the 1960s, whether women wore pants to church was right up there with whether you believe in Jesus. It was, oh, it was. And how long is long hair? Oh, man. It was, yeah, it was very, very specific. Oh, I would have been dead then. Yeah, no, well, 
No. I don't think they would have liked the men, but. No, that's what I'm saying. I no, no. I don't understand why the men couldn't wear long hair if they chose to. Didn't they <laughs> wore long hair back to the time? Well, what people you quoted. See, what I believe in and what you believe in may not be the same thing. My boys wore long hair when it wasn't the thing to do. Because it was easier for me to deal with than to run into the barbershop. Well, uh, my son, not everybody was wearing long hair when he was in high school, but he did. My wife and I talked about it. It was her who initiated the, uh, the discussion. She said, if this is his rebellion, if that he wants to wear long hair, if that's the let's go with that. If that's have a problem with, let him, leave him, let right. him be as they would say. Leave now, rebellious. the example where people got confused <laughs> about uh, tradition and scripture is, you can go back to where there were some women in Corinth who were disruptive to the church. Yeah. And they were told to wear some kind of head covering if they didn't have long hair. And his argument is, can't you look around and see it's normal that women have long hair and men have short hair? But the word he used was natural. And so everybody was saying, and this is gonna be hard for some of you to believe, but in the 1960s, before the Beatles, <laughs> People in America thought that men could not grow their hair as long as women could. Their hair grows faster than the women's anyway, most of but, but they cut it every weekend. <laughs> yeah, it's natural that it's cut. It just looks groomed all the time. That's natural. Well, yeah. So they got confused on that, and we like people to have short hair. Um, it's more important to figure out what's in here than it's worry about the nuts of the hair. Right. But they, well, and that's, that's the challenge I'm talking about. Are you looking to scripture to see what it says or to prove what you want oh, to keep doing? Culture, to look at it, it was the, the escorts of that they would shave their head bald. Right. And so that's how you could tell. That could be a cult. That could be in the service. There are a lot of places where you shave your hair because right. you have not a choice. But you need to be aware if it means something in your culture. I still think, did any of you see any of the clips of Aretha Franklin's funeral? I saw some of it. Did you see Ariana Grande? Yes. She had a skirt up to here. <laughs> you serious? Well, she was, oh, yeah. is that the one with the... It just wasn't fitting. It wasn't fitting. No, it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't appropriate for that. If I had on something like that, I think my mother would have reached her from the grave and slapped me. <laughs> Somebody, some famous person put on her Twitter, she obviously has not read the manual for black Baptist churches. You don't stand near no, a pulpit you with your... No, you don't, showing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's also a picture of President Clinton ogling her. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, he does that. He's good at that. So, He'll I do think that down. principle applies from the Corinthian situation. Do not defy convention in a way that distracts people from the purpose of a gathering, particularly a Christian gathering. That applies. Another one where they tried to apply it on well, the women wearing pants, and now with, with people cross-dressing is, the Old Testament says that it's sinful for a man to wear a woman's clothes. That's not all it says. Oh, no. But they were looking for a principle. Even as a preteen and teen, I could tell. Okay, all the pictures in my Sunday school books show men and women wearing robes. We're not talking about pants versus dresses here. Choir robes. Yeah. So? So it, it was obvious to me they were talking about tradition. And there's some people who like that tradition. All. Oh. Uh, Mama just says, I guess I'll wear pants again, but I don't like to wear pants to church now. Because she has some trouble on, on how she wants to dress. But anyway, they did bind their traditions. Let me tell you a rule. When I went to Harding, uh, another Church of Christ school in Arkansas, the rule for smoking was, Men may smoke in their rooms or the rooms of other men who smoke. Women may not smoke. Period. <laughs> Wait a second. Mm -hmm. that, I mean, it has good logic. I don't care. <laughs> Put a dress on him. <laughs> <laughs> Can you see that that might have been something traditional and maybe a board member who smoked or something like that who was male? Mm -hmm. 
Well, they bound well, their condition. The, 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 the women are glad that they made that rule now. Oh, yeah, eventually they said that we don't want you smoking on our campus. But yeah. women always live longer. <laughs> it is, this was, this is the Sanhedrin, which is part of the Talmud, which is the official Jewish commentaries on the scriptures. It is more culpable to teach against the ordinances of the scribes than to teach against the Torah itself. It's a worse thing to go against our traditional interpretations than to argue against scripture. Now, when you put it that bold face, it's like, really? Yeah. But I'll tell you what, you talk to people who have always approached scripture the same way you do, and you depart from someone that everyone has always respected as a good interpreter, and you may, be, you may be more on the outs than if you disagreed on what an actual scripture said. When you don't follow the party line. But, of course, when they would criticize Jesus, it was for not keeping the traditions of the elders. They were not written down at that time, but they were as well established. There are many, many rules that are not written down that are much more firmly established than written down rules. That's just the way society runs. Now, the Pharisees were not politically influential in the time of Jesus. Later, they outlasted the Sadducees, and in fact, the traditions of the Pharisees became what we later came to call Judaism. So that's the Pharisees, strict, trying to be strict about God's law, but equally, at least equally, enforcing their own interpretations of the law, but not involved with the politics of the mixed up uh, Roman, Greek, Jewish societies. The Sadducees, yes, that's how I remember. You, you too? How do you remember the difference in the Pharisees and Sadducees? They don't believe in the resurrection. They're sad, you see. You <laughs> see? I remember that one from Oh, I, everybody remembers that. <laughs> now, they said only the Torah is authoritative, which, of course, is the first five books of the Old Testament. And so anything else is optional. If you can't show it to me verbatim from the first five books of the Bible, we're just talking about your preference and mine. And they not only said that the traditions of the Pharisees, which the Pharisees called the traditions of the elders, not only were they not binding, sometimes they were incorrect. Kind of a reformation, you know, almost. This is the verse I was talking about, verse, uh, Acts 23, 8. It wasn't Jesus, it was in Acts. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit. But the Pharisees acknowledged them all. So there was this rift. It would be a mistake to do this, but I'll do it anyway. Maybe like progressive liberal interpreters of scripture today who say there are some principles there, but all these other interpretations are just that. Versus very conservative, probably within one particular uh, vein of interpretation, people who say, oh no, you've got to interpret it right also. And I'm the one who did interpret it right. They claimed that only priests could make an authoritative application of the Torah, but it's not the same. We're kind of back to the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court may rule that this is right or wrong. It doesn't make it right or wrong, but it makes it the law. And that's what they were saying. Now they were closely connected to the priesthood and the temple. They tended to be from among wealthy families, aristocratic families. Therefore, since the control, um, and since the uh, positions in the temple were just political appointments by that time, you can see how the wealthy people, the aristocratic people, would be in charge of the temple, but they had to turn to the Pharisees to find out what the real rules were. After the destruction of the temple in AD 70, the Sadducees disappeared. There seems to have been a social 
uh, based on their social position, which disappeared after the destruction of Jerusalem. And you find that the Sadducees are more accommodating to the Roman authorities, where the Pharisees are more preserving Jewish uh, distinctiveness. So you got the Pharisees and the Sadducees down. Let's do the Zealots first. Weren't the Zealots always trying to like, not like revolt, but like do like a kind of like almost terrorist acts against Rome? Yes, we was could compare called, them to, to terrorists. Was Paul considered a Zealot? Uh, I never heard him called that, but I think some could. Oh, there was a, one of the um, apostles. Was a Simon the Zealot. Zealot. No, Simon was a Zealot. Yeah. Yeah. And Saul um, was considered Zealot, Zealous and the, the Spirit. Right. It's... um. It's not quite as loose as the term, well, it's looser than the term terrorist, but it included terrorists. So it was like a radical. Radicals, yes. Yeah. Uh, again, if you've heard any of the news about uh, the hearings for the Supreme Court nominee, there were rude members of Congress and even ruder members of the public in the audience that are just yelling, screaming over the, the proceedings. And they are zealots for whatever... I, mean, I guess to keep this guy from being on the Supreme Court. Uh, zealot is, is, is really, ex well, you know, it comes from zeal. And wh whether they were a specific organized group, you can't pin that down any more than you can about which Islamic groups are, are organized. Um, but they believed that they would advance the cause of God by any means, including terrorism. They rejected all human powers and authorities as evil. Uh, I can't speak... Well, sort of. But they felt like God should be the ruler. Which, I, I agree with them on that. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, Their means of getting it done was a little bit... Right. Uh, but I think that um, you, you define New Testament scripture, which says that the powers that be were established by God. He allows human authorities. And they were seriously opposed to the Roman authorities because you couldn't get farther away from the will of God than to be a pagan power. So those were the zealots. They're not specifically identified, but it was religion was a part of who they were. Now the Essenes are a really interesting group. They're not mentioned in the New Testament, but they are important to understanding the New Testament. Probably Essenes was a pretty large category that incorporated many different groups. There was a significant number. They were kind of um, extremist, not in the negative sense, but cult-like, not in the abusive sense, but cult-like, and they withdrew from society. Around 150 B.C., if you remember, that's kind of during the, the uh, Jewish revolt that led to the Hasmoneans. They withdrew into the really, really, really awful part of the desert um, at a place we now call Qumran. So they withdrew from society, went off to live in their own communes. They disappear around 31 BC and based on archaeological and, and, um, and also human records, there seems to have been a significant earthquake around that time. Uh, they uh, come back after the death of Herod the Great, and they're active again. The most important thing is right in the middle. They produce the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were found in 1947, uh, two years before my older sister was born. We'll talk much more about them. Now, the Qumran group was a structured sect who withdrew from society. Sometimes they were anti-temple, or at least anti-who's running the temple now. They lived in a commune or in a deserted area. They were legalistically ritual. They rejected all luxury, uh, some of them even practicing celibacy which explains why they're not still around. They were devoted 
to scripture and prayer, but also to washings. You don't get baptized once. There's all kinds of washings. They believed in predestination. They believed in the pre-existence and immortality of the soul. And their central focus was that they were the righteous remnant awaiting the imminent arrival of the Messiah. Uh, that has been a theme in later Christianity as well. You know, the, the groups that pull off and, and, and like Jesus was going to come in 1940-something. Jesus is going to come at this time. And the righteous remnant, it's just them. They're the only ones who've got it right. So they're practically... They missed that like, part where it says no man knows the day or the hour. I don't worry when somebody names a date. I figure I'm okay on that one. What? So, like, they're kind of like the Amish? Something like that. Or, in other ways, perhaps like Jehovah's Witnesses? Yeah. Well, yeah. doctrinally. Doctrinally, then lifestyle, they're occult. Mm hmm. They are. Mm hmm. I mean, I get what you're saying. It does kind of sound like Amish because they got yeah. rid of all, well, they get rid of all luxuries. They luxuries. seclude themselves. They live in communes. Right. Right. So, interesting. This is one of their little towns, one of their communes, the remnants of it. This is looking out from one of the caves where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Uh, another close up at the middle bottom of, uh, you know, they built little cities of their own. Um, that one at the top, you see that little window-like part of the cave? They stored some things there. I'll come to the last picture in a minute. Uh, the idea seems to be that they felt threatened by something in society. It could have been the earthquake. It could have been pressures of various uh, who's ever taking over the region. And they went and they hid their scrolls in caves. And they were still there in 1947. Now the bottom one is one of Herod's palaces. That's Masada. And there are writings of Essenes there as well. At times they would have retreated there after it wasn't Herodian. So their existence predates Christ and may continue after Christ. But they are an off-by-themselves sect. Their significance is in what they left behind. I believe, I know that the top right is the Isaiah scroll. Now, when I said the oldest copies we have of scripture, uh, of Hebrew scripture, that's a whole Old Testament in Hebrew. It would be about 1,000 A.D. This is B.C. It is the oldest copy of the entire scroll of Isaiah. It becomes important to the discussion of whether Isaiah is a collection of at least two different writers or one writer because it continues right where many scholars say it's a different book uh, without pausing. Uh, they are on display in this, um, what do they call that? But anyway, it's, the, it's the, something of the scroll. Uh, many of them are on display. What you see over there is evidently a picture of when they were first found. I put these, and I'll post them for you. Uh, I'm going to pick up just the last two uh, links for you to look at. Notice this is a, a link to an internet type magazine. And it might even come up. I'm going to skim it to show it something you might want to read later. Don't we have fast computers here? <laughs> All right. They come to life on the web. Google has helped work with high resolution pictures of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which have been kept under wraps for a very long time by, by um, people. <laughs> now, there are some other groups that come up that you need to be aware of, but they're not really entirely uh, religious groups. We read occasionally in the Gospels about the Herodians. It doesn't say who they are. I think it means people who were associated with the Herod family, or maybe those who supported the Herods. Yeah. I think that's all it means. It can't be that many of 
<laughs> well, I would say all the rich people. Now, no, all I feel like all of them would be beheaded by now. <laughs> Well, by that time. Only if they're perceived as a threat. Everyone's perceived as a threat. Right. Now, the Samaritans, I'm sure you're aware that the area between Galilee and Judea is Samaria. You know from the story of the Good Samaritan, or Jesus talking with the Samaritan woman, that they were outcast to the traditional Jews. They, and it went both ways. They were ethnically and religiously mixed in culture, religion, and race, if you can call uh, children of Israel a race, uh, let's say in genetic lineage. They come from, if you remember studying the captivity of the Jews at the end of the Old Testament, the poorest of the poor were left behind. So they were just the dregs of, society, of Jewish society that were left behind, had no one else to make families with but the ones that the conquerors brought in to replace the Jews, and so they were mixed. Now, they had a rival temple on Mount Gerizim, which is not too far from Jerusalem, but uh, Mount Gerizim is in the Bible, but they had a temple there, and they say, it's always been where the temple was. And that the Jerusalem-based Jews changed their scriptures to say Jerusalem was the place. That makes sense. Except that Jesus <laughs> acknowledges the Jerusalem temple. No, 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 I, it, I was being yeah. sarcastic. sarcastic. Yeah. Now, by the way, there are still Samaritans there. Last time I checked, about 700 of them. They continue to observe Passover in the traditional way. Uh, they have their own concept of Judaism. They get along just fine with uh, Israeli Jews now. Uh, and I guess they are Israeli. Yeah. Well, the thing that brings us to our New Testament context is that that rival temple was destroyed when the Maccabees came in to, to set things right for Judaism. Now think, 128 years. Did y'all see that John McCain's mother went to the funeral? She's 106 years old. Whoa. And she was in good shape. So when we talk about 128 years, that's not that long ago to them. I might make it. <laughs> we'll check with you next year. <laughs> I'll be here. <laughs> well, but in that, well, we remember, no, you've been told about the Twin Towers falling in New York, right? I don't know, I was working underneath them really? that particular night, I had oh. school work. And you will always remember, with some bad feelings towards whoever did that, that day, and you would well, not trust those people. the grace of God, we were able to get out. I'm glad you got it. I worked for New York Navy Transit Authority, and I had a crew working <laughs> underneath <laughs> the towers, because our subways run right. under the ground. Right. You ever been to New York? I've been to New York, but not since the tragedy. No, no, I'm not talking about, but you did you know, no. see the subways, they ran under the right. ground. And in they fact, that's where the museum is now, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, we don't forget that. And you know, they, they attacked the Pentagon, but we patched that up, and you can hardly tell it. But they were aiming for either the, white or the Capitol. If they had destroyed the Capitol, I guarantee you 128 years from that time, Americans would still be mad at those people, right? Well, the Jews had destroyed the Samaritan Temple. No wonder they didn't like each other. That's like coming into someone else's home and, and violating it. Right. And you don't get over it, and the next generation doesn't get over it. Now, they were similar and different from the Jews in their religion. Uh, they considered just the Torah to be um, scripture, but they have their own Samaritan Pentateuch, which doesn't include Jerusalem. And that's why they reject the Hebrew scriptures. So when you see the conflict,